Welcome to the Literary Hangover. My name is Matt Leck. With me, Alex Guns. Hello. Uh, this is the second episode we're recording on Nathaniel Hawthorne, but the first you'll probably be listening to because we're going to go a bit deeper into his uh, biography here. We're doing Young Goodman Brown, uh, which is a short story uh, Hawthorne originally published in uh, New England Magazine in 1835, and uh, we're going to get right to it here with some biographical detail about Nathaniel Hawthorne before we get into uh, Young Goodman Brown. So this is a 2003 interview on C-SPAN with Brian Lamb, who does a really good job at these sorts of things, uh, talking with uh, a biographer of Hawthorne, Brenda Wineapple, who wrote Hawthorne, A Life. And uh, one of the reasons we're going to be spending a number of uh, episodes on Hawthorne is because of his historical outlook. He's obsessed with the Puritans, Scarlet Letter being his most famous story, but also, you know, in uh, Maple of Marymount, which we have also talked about, and uh, the House of Seven Gables is also sort of uh, focused on the sort of historical lineage that Hawthorne himself was actually familiarly connected to. His grandfather was uh, a judge, or great-grandfather was a judge during the uh, witch trials, uh, and did not cover himself in glory uh, really at all. He was Actually, we should just go to one of those first to kick off, to, so, so we know, sort of know what uh, is in Hawthorne's past that he he was aware of. Uh, we'll get to his sort of education. Um, and we'll cover the witch trials more in depth later on. We'll cover it a bit during the Scarlet Letter episode, but we'll also be talking about The Crucible by Arthur Miller. Uh, so we don't want to, I don't want to you know, go through it all here, but um, here's just a, a brief mention of how Hawthorne uh, Haythorn, as it was called, Hawthorne actually added a W to his last name. It's, there's some speculation that this is to distance himself from this dark family legacy, although I think his fiction that sort of draws attention to it might argue against that. But here's just a moment from uh, A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Witch Trials and the American Experience by Emerson Baker. He goes into uh, Hawthorne's role in um, basically the Puritans' destruction of their own judicial system uh, with superstition. Ordering the constables to arrest the women and have them at Ingersoll's Ordinary, or Tavern, by ten the next morning for questioning. The tavern was in the heart of Salem Village, a minute's walk from the parsonage and meeting house. The next morning, so many people tried to crowd into Ingersoll's for the hearings that the proceedings had to be moved down the street to the much larger meeting house. All four afflicted girls were there to face their tormentors. The accused were questioned one at a time, starting with Sarah Good. Hathorne led the interrogations, more like a modern-day police detective grilling a subject for a confession than an impartial judge. From the nature of the unrelenting questions he asked, it is clear that he believed witchcraft was at work and that the three women were responsible. What evil spirit have you familiarity with? Have you made no contact with the devil? Why do you hurt these children? Good's denials were to no avail. When the four girls confirmed their identification of Sarah as their tormentor, she denied the charge, at which point the girls became all dreadfully tortured and tormented for a short space of time. That's Hawthorne's great-grandfather. This book, which we will uh, cite in the future, goes into how you know our conception of the Salem witch trials as sort of like uh, women calling other women witches mm -hmm. is uh, lacking in terms of like the real significance of the episode, which is basically like the Mather family and that Puritan uh, patriarchy completely discredit itself with by killing multiple members of its community because it, they thought they were witches mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about this more but it's it that's such an interesting um uh watershed between the 1600s and the 1700s to me and and this is what we'll also talk with young goodman brown the innocence is o over and the naivety is over and how you react to seeing you know reality um and adjusting to actual reality is uh a huge trial for people 
Yeah, and I think if in the broader context of Europe at that moment and immediately preceding it was just an unrelenting time of religious violence, primarily like the Thirty Years' War and then the English Civil War to a lesser degree, is European Christianity at that moment in particular, you almost couldn't escape the idea of zealously persecuting your enemies for... Like that, that was the definition of religious liberty at that moment. And even if you cross the Atlantic, it was inescapable. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, now that we sort of know where Hawthorne's background is, let's just play a little bit from this. But this Brenda Wineapple, she's, the, the, her biography is really good about Hawthorne, and I might play for some from that. And I definitely will in, in some episodes. Um, but she also appears in the C SPAN in 2003. Um, and this is on YouTube. The interview really focuses a lot on. Hawthorne's politics, and part of that is because it's a C-SPAN interview, but also Hawthorne was uh, significantly intertwined from a young age with uh, political people, Franklin Pierce being the uh, foremost among those. Uh, Here's this 2003 interview uh, with Brenda Wineapple. Brenda Wineapple, author of A Life, Hawthorne. How much did politics play in his life? It played a much larger role than people have liked to think. Um, He was a political man, he was involved in politics, and he was best friends with arguably one of the worst American presidents, which is saying something. Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce. How did he get to know Franklin Pierce? They met at college. They were at Bowdoin together. Pierce was a year ahead of Hawthorne. Pierce um, was a very gregarious, outgoing, warm, and genial person, and he and Hawthorne became friends. They actually marched together in a little group called the Bowdoin Cadets. One doesn't think of Hawthorne marching, and certainly not marching behind anyone, but they did. Um, And also, politics at Bowdoin was very important. They were both um, what became Democrats. They were Jeffersonian Republicans at the time. So that was a very important connection between the two men then. They stayed friends for their entire lives. All right, we'll stop it there. I want to cut a little bit ahead to where they talk about what Democrat meant at that time, which I think is actually very important for sort of what politics is now. Yeah. Uh, You you know, there's lots of problems with the Democratic Party, uh, but at no point was it ever like a truly Democratic Party, right? Like uh, it was a Democratic Party for white men. Yeah, yeah. They, they They were known at that moment for widening the franchise from white property owning men to just white men so which like good job yeah, but, yeah. you know like <laughs> good but maybe not enough yeah that's that, this is where they needed a little bit of inter- intersectionality <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah here's where uh, they talk a bit more specifically about what democrat meant in the uh, sort of early early party it's kicked out and it was quite a brouhaha so that was the next major appointment and that lasted until 1849 as a matter of fact you wrote uh, page 380 he uh, stood for dark doubt and the democratic party right start was the democratic party what was the democratic party back in the 1800s 1850s it developed out of jackson it's the sort of jacksonian democrats and the and the democratic party in those years was more like today's republicans important to sort of remember who became what the democrats um stood very strongly for states rights and as a result, early on, they became a party associated with expansion, manifest destiny, as I said, expanding territories uh, to the west, even to the south, and partly as a consequence of that, they also became associated with uh, pro-slavery. A large part of the Democratic Party was pro-slavery, was a pro-slavery wing. It separated out later on as, as politics got even more dicey than they were. <clears throat> but it was also a progressive party in that it was for the working person, um, it was stood against a kind of moneyed capitalist aristocracy, say, of Boston, which was associated with the Whigs. So by um, Hawthorne and then Pierce and his friends at Bowdoin joining with the Jacksonian Democrats, they felt that they were joining with something that was youthful, exciting, exuberant, offered a kind of real hope and egalitarianism for America, which was true as long as you were my- white and male. But that was true, and that was the vision. So it was a kind of um, it, it, it was a kind of party in the sense of optimism, a kind of party of reform too, which is interesting because then later, when it becomes associated with pro-slavery, pro-slavery forces, we tend to then think of that party as being um, conservative, benighted, reactionary. It was more complicated than that. The Republicans rose out of the Whig Party that was against the Democrats and the anti-slavery Whigs. The conscience Whigs and the anti-slavery Democrats joined forces eventually, 
by 1860 elected Lincoln as a Republican. Hawthorne stayed true to the Democratic Party all the way through, even though lots of people left it, became either, if they didn't become Whigs, that would be too hard, became, went to the Republicans, because after all, the Republicans seemed to uh, um, promise some of the things that the Democrats stood for, but also anti-slavery. Hawthorne did not. So he was in the most, he stayed with the most conservative part of the Democratic Party, which eventually fell apart. I always like when people in history have that moment to get out, you know, where it's it's a um, it's obscure w- where they land specifically on an issue, and then they defend that issue to the death. Like they they go beyond the pale and be like, no, this is this is why I'm part of the Democratic Party. It's it's for the slavery. Yeah, and you have to confront that in a way. And it, to me, this is a new thing I've been thinking about an awful lot, which is that the people in your immediate social circle. Uh, determine your and this is not true for me because I'm a person who had very heterodox politics and beliefs even as a high schooler in North Dakota that nobody else really even fed into uh, so I am I am a genuine independent think, thinker thank you for listening to my podcast <laughs> but uh, I think a lot of people it's 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 what's comfortable to get along with the people around you and yeah. like you could co- if you go to uh a college with a bunch of like young Democrats, which I'm imagining turning point USA. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I, I imagining like Hawthorne as a young little, like a like demo. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a weird thing because like you, like, I don't know, I don't know, I guess exactly what I'm trying to say here, but I do want to go to uh, specifically on slavery. So there are two things. Hawthorne was especially bad on slavery being the preeminent one. He's just awful on it. Uh, and we'll get to that. The other one I just want to mention briefly because it's famous is uh, Hawthorne. Uh, he was successful and known, but he wasn't a bestseller. He was sort of more the um, the critic's choice. The that, writer's writer. Yeah, wouldn't sell much. But he got annoyed. This is a, a quote from the Brenda Wineapple biography. Marina Susanna Cummings, the lamplighter, selling 40,000 copies in two months, triggered another blast. Quote, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women, Hawthorne cried in 1855, and I should have no chance of success while the public taste is occupied with their trash and should be ashamed of myself if I did succeed. Which wow. is a perfect, like, encapsula- like that insulates you from success and failure, right? Like, if I did succeed, I'd be selling out. Oh, it's such a timeless art- artist trope. And be, I wouldn't want to be successful anyways. It's really... Uh, kind of baffling that women get this reputation of not engaging with like the real things where, because it seems to me the opposite where like, you know, Catherine Maria, Maria Sedgwick's Hope Leslie has all sorts of like a Pequot war, all, all sorts of that stuff. Whereas like, it seems, it seems like the people who buy into this idea that women writers weren't talking about real things, Lydia Maria Child with Hobomach too. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's like what's real is if we, valorize heroic characters right that's what's real yeah that this man he beats the odds and does his honorable duty not like this story captures what's really going on socio-politically in a community at a given time like that's not real yeah to me it seems like it'd be the opposite way around just based on the way people like hawthorne or or people who have been influenced by this sort of like strain of misogynistic thought that like women are doing like nice domestic st- stories or whatever the, the the cliche would be is I think men are as bad at writing like just pointless crap uh, <laughs> uh, and it's seemingly worse as far as in the survey that I've done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think for maybe someone like Hawthorne who from what we've read is deeply interested in history and how history affects the present would probably see women as well. They're not on like the historical continuum. There are no great women leaders with the exception of a few freaks. So they're not even really part of like the grand narrative of history. Yeah. He, he at uh, other points says that women writing, like it takes a sort of disrobing to be a writer that should be beneath women. Um, (laughs) Which is, which is also odd given that like, he's also worried about being a, male writer in a feminine profession that's a huge that's actually a real yeah. anxiety for like a lot of these writers at this time which is and there's a lot of that going on in this short story that we'll get into right uh just a little bit on uh, hawthorne's uh um slavery uh politics 
Uh, in Civil War, I guess, to be more precise. Funny. While he was the consulship, while he was consul for Liverpool uh, under the Pierce administration. And part of the reason he took that job was to make, it was a very lucrative job to make that money. You said at the time a good house would cost $3,000. Yeah. But you also said at the time. Oh, yeah, this goes into him. He, uh, Franklin Pierce gave, hooked him up with jobs, uh, and the Democratic Party hooked him up with jobs a number of times. The Custom House, which is the introduction to the Scarlet Letter, is him basically lamenting how being on the government dole saps your energy <laughs> um, or like will to live. We'll talk more about that in a later episode. And then here he talks about like, yeah, he, when Pierce was president, uh, well, in the campaign, uh, Hawthorne wrote a biography of Pierce, uh, the official campaign biography. And w- for his efforts was repaid with the Liverpool basically customs gig that he basically got to skim off the top uh, on the transactions. So as Brenda's saying here, he made $10,000 one year and like a house cost 3000 <laughs> Is this Is this like the first public intellectual or that we can think of in American history that was that ingratiated with the White House? With the White House? Or um, with, that, like, with the president? I think... Uh, I don't know specifically. You know, we, we had talked about Washington Irving going to the Madison's White House. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, and Irving himself also wrote, like, a, um, biographies for John Jacob Astor's Astoria Project, the, the oh, fur right. trading empire in western Washington. Oh, he also wrote, like, a history of the Navy. If you're a writer, you can get political gigs. Yeah, well, him writing, Hawthorne writing a biography of Franklin Pierce on the campaign trail has a very modern edge to it. Like, that mm-hmm. sounds very familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if we're, in a, we're in a time now where it probably, they would probably just ghostwrite it mm-hmm. or have somebody ghostwrite it. Like, I, I don't know that... Um, Obama might be different, right? Like, you could see a celebrity uh, author writing an Obama biography... Um, yeah, I, I was thinking of Gore Vidal and JFK, mm-hmm. which I don't, he didn't write a biography directly, but he definitely uh, helped a lot in the campaign. Uh, here's what, uh, this is back to that C-SPAN interview. You said at the time a good house would cost $3,000. Yeah. But you also said at the time in order to get <laughs> stay out of the Civil War, you could spend $300. Right, that's right, that's right. And what did he do in connection with war? Well, he was too old to fight. And had he, it's, it's unclear whether he would have wanted to or not. Some days he felt he wanted to grab that musket and, and shoot someone, but mostly he was so horrified by the bloodletting that was the Civil War because daily there were reports of friends of his children or nephews being lost or, or maimed or, um, or run away, something like that. And he was, he was aghast at the whole thing but he was he was um he was brutalized by the war and he was very critical of the north and of the south both so he was anti-war i would say he was anti-war yeah which is an anomalous thing to be in that time it's almost as if you know the modern corollary would be anti-war although some people were robert law um during the second world war and now to us we think well how could you have been an anti-nazi how could you have been anti-war well there was a way in in the civil war for a northerner living in concord massachusetts neighbor of um of thoreau neighbor of emerson to be anti-war when in point of fact the war was being fought from these people's point of view to emancipate the slaves, you know, to get rid of slavery is a, is a strange position. Sounds like a, an all lives matter type of guy. You know, I think it's more s- even subtle than that. He's like a never Trump sort of conservative God. that doesn't really... <sighs> like there's a, there's a type of conservative that sees what's going on and is like, yeah, I don't like this, but both sides are just everyone just needs to calm down and let let it Hawthorne didn't think that reform could get rid of slavery he thought it would just have to get rid of itself uh, and basically says that any attempts by man to intervene in this system would lead to uh, just something worse hmm. that sounds like wisdom to a lot of people yeah and at certain points in history it could be I guess it's very Jeffersonian yeah but it's also this sort of anti-conflict civility bullshit that, frankly, when push comes to shove in historical moments, doesn't fly. Yeah, well, it just goes back to the initial premise that 
they're not enacting anything. It's just an act of nature, mm-hmm. essentially. They're right. just the stewards of this thing that's of natural order for the right. most part. Despite the fact that, like, throughout all this time, they're doing things to maintain it. Yeah, yeah. Like, taking active measures to maintain it. That's probably enough for uh, Hawthorne's politics. But I, I, I want to foreground that because I, I do think the way young Goodman Brown in our story comes up uh, gets his sort of um, uh, cherry popped, shall we say? With um, <laughs> should we not say that? I mean, you can say that. Um, that sounds like such, like that. Just that was like my. Uh, that's like a Madeline cookie, but to go back to like freshman year of high yeah, school. Yeah, exactly. Like, I've not heard that phrase I in mean, the longest it's such time. A, the metaphor is, um, you know, just incredibly apt. Yeah, I mean, in certain ways, I think there there are sexual elements to this. Um, yes, uh, and gender politics, right? Um, so strap in. But I, but I, I think the I I think that. The way young Goodman Brown reacts to seeing, as we'll see, like different people in these sort of the satanic woods is how certain conservative could believe there's no difference between Republican Party corruption and Democratic Party corruption. Mm. Um, maybe this is a, that's a bit of a stretch as an analogy, but um, like the loss of, of innocence and realizing what the world actually is is uh, is an interesting theme to me. I want to play a little bit from this is a uh, English 33350 American Literature to 1865 with Dr. Barry Wood at the University of Houston. He's got a number of lectures on YouTube and I think he does a pretty good job. Um they uh, these lectures might be a bit old. It says this was uploaded in like 2010, but it looks a bit older than that and mm-hmm. uh, well here's the music. This is, I mean, this is, to be fair, this is waiting for the show to start. We'll skip a little bit ahead here. Man, what if this was your day, like, putting this track together? Well, that's the best part is, like, like iTunes U and things like that. Like, all right, just a straight recording. But you could tell in this early edition of, like, recording... um, lectures like well we have to make it it's television yeah we have to make yeah, it exciting exactly. and so it's like shots of the quad people walking to the cafeteria with like the coolest music you could possibly get for free wood goes off on this um he has a really good sensitivity it seems to me to the uh theocratic uh elements of mm-hmm. it i'm gonna play this a little bit here Actually, I'll, I'll play his intro to the, the story a little bit, too, so people can get a, a little bit of an idea for what's coming up here. Young Goodman Brown he is an equally interesting story. The story of a naive young man, newly married, just three months to his wife, Faith. He is a, a, a third-generation Puritan. He has a, a Puritan family of renowned people, his father and his grandfather. And... In the story, he makes a journey one night into the forest uh, around Salem, where he lives. And this challenges his assumptions about his community, about his family, and about his wife. And the result, to put it very simply, is that he has changed forever. All right, that's probably enough to tease, because we are going to just play the entire uh, short story and listen along with you. Uh, Here he goes into the... uh the uh, the sort of religious background and context for uh, our uh, protagonist, young Goodman Brown. Now, there are other things to say here. If we try to interpret this uh, this allegory, I suppose it seems to be an allegory in that faith is, you know, stands not only for his wife but for his religion. If he is just three months married to faith, following that through allegorically, he appears to be a recent convert to the Puritan religion. Three months ago, he's converted to the Puritan religion. Now, this presents a puzzle because the story suggests that his father and his grandfather were good Puritans. So how could he be in a line of good Puritans, grandfather and father, and yet be a recent convert to the Puritan religion? Well, here we need to to remember a little bit of Puritan history. The, to, become, to be recognized as a Puritan, one was supposed to show signs of having God's grace. This was a problem in the early Puritan years in New England because it meant that children couldn't be, couldn't be part of the religion until they were old enough to manifest God's grace. 
and uh, the early Puritans recognized that their numbers were going to greatly dwindle in this situation. And this is why the halfway covenant was invented in 1662, which allowed a baby to be baptized and to be in a halfway situation. Their full entry into the church would then be held off until their adult years when some kind of grace situation was apparent, and then they could be admitted to full membership. The Halfway Covenant um, was, was 1662, and as I say, it allowed children and grandchildren to, to grow up within the church without being fully admitted, pending a kind of full conversion at, in their adult years. And this would explain how Goodman Brown is both a descendant of Puritans in his grandfather and his father, and also a recent convert. He is an example of someone, he's a third generation Puritan who grew up in this halfway situation and now he's converted into it. Uh, presumably then he's waited for God's grace for years and now just recently he's evidenced signs of God's grace and allowed him a, f a full marriage to the faith. It's interesting to me how political a lot of, like when, when a body that claims to be acting upon sort of fundamental religious principles is forced to react to things like pop the population is growing uh we need to like have some way to control these people and filter them into our church but we also don't want to dilute the sort of worship that we're doing and like i remember hearing about the halfway covenant i didn't i, I didn't remember what it really was until re-researching it for this but like i remember that was in like social studies books oh really yeah I don't remember learning about it in school. No. Nope. It's interesting to see new social movements, new at the time, how they kind of, with the exception of specifics, all become rather similar. And that this is like, of course you need some sort of rite of passage to be recognized as an adult in the community. Any social community essentially has this rite of passage. And you can only in the very like Hawthorne sense, you really can only be a different or unique or utopian society until the real world comes crashing in. And like the society has to have a coming of age moment mm -hmm. almost. So it's like the, conflating the micro and the macro that Hawthorne seems to do quite a lot. Actually. Let's play just a little bit more of this and see, and then we'll go, go to the story. Doctrinally, I think it, it's clear that this story comments on the halfway covenant which allowed hundreds of Puritan youth to attend church on the presumption that grace would come. And notice the way I've phrased that, on the presumption that grace would come. This essentially, within the Puritan context, actually tended to weaken the Puritan religion. When grace finally came to the adult, the, the person was in a position where they could say, well, that was easy. <laughs> and of course you see that presumption is occurring here, that the Puritans in introducing the halfway covenant were actually introducing the sin of, of a possible sin of presumption into the system. And um, this of course then laid the groundwork for the possible falling out of grace and the attitude that one could fall out of grace and easily get back into grace. And you see how the, the, the youth of, of waiting for grace and then the easy entrance into the religion uh, could set up the, f the framework for an attitude that one could fall in and out very easily. One could indulge momentarily and still be saved. In other words, young Goodman Brown's moral laxity has been prepared for by the structure of the religion of which he is a part. Arguably, he never really did receive full grace. Uh, no one who had, we could argue, would ever expose themselves to temptation in this way. Yeah. So that that it is interesting how the structural thing can create difficult psychological uh, event in a person that they're not really prepared for. Especially when that structure is based on binary, which this short story is grapples with the entire time. Like you're either damned or uh, the elect. Yes. And you, there's you you shift back and forth, and that's it. All right. So uh, let's actually get down to uh, business here. Uh, by the way, this is from LibriVox. Hmm. Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset into the street at Salem Village, but put his head back, after crossing the threshold, to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife. And Faith, as the wife was aptly named, thrust her own pretty head into the street letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her cap while she called to Goodman Brown. Dearest heart, whispered she, 
softly and rather sadly, when her lips were close to his ear. Prithee put off your journey until sunrise, and sleep in your own bed tonight. A lone woman is troubled with such dreams and such thoughts that she is afeard of herself sometimes. Please tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights in the year. That of all nights in the year, the suggestion is this is uh, All Hallows' Eve. Mm -hmm. My love and my faith, replied young Goodman Brown. Of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey, as thou callest it, forth and back again, must needs be done twixt now and sunrise. What, my sweet pretty wife, dost thou doubt me already, and we but three months married? Then God bless you, said Faith with the pink ribbons. It's easy. And may you yeah. find all well when you come back. Amen, cried Goodman Brown. Say thy prayers, dear Faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. So they parted, and the young man pursued his way until, being about to turn the corner by the meeting house, he looked back and saw the head of Faith, still peeping after him with a melancholy air, in spite of her pink ribbons. Poor little Faith, thought he, for his heart smote him. What a wretch am I to leave her on such an errand. She talks of dreams, too. Methought as she spoke there was trouble in her face, as if a dream had warned her what work is to be done tonight. But no, no, twould kill her to think it. Well, she's a blessed angel on earth, and after this one night I'll cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. Just as uh, enlightened males that we are, that she's a blessed angel of heaven. <laughs> yeah. Like, not the, not the best way to think of your significant other. No. Like, that, that can lead to some disappointment and maybe some ang an angry response on your part. Well, a weird relationship to have, which you're essentially the person's parent, almost. Mm. I mean, out of all the flat female characters we've read, this one has got to be the worst mm. or the most egregious and i think it attempts to get away with it by saying it's a an allegory which you know obviously it is but it's like it's still a, a character it has to it has to exhibit some sort of uniqueness to itself which from my reading nothing there's nothing there that i, I can't gleam anything from her with this excellent resolve for the future goodman brown felt himself justified in making more haste on his present evil purpose. He had taken a dreary road, darkened by all the gloomiest trees of the forest, which barely stood aside to let the narrow path creep through, and closed immediately behind. What's interesting about this as, as a setup for a story is we only know that what he's about to do is wrong, but we don't know what it is and why it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And also the collapsing of the real world and the dream world immediately. Right. That she, ha she had possible premonitions of danger, and like, and in this story, how real that is and how important that is, is uh, not clear. In the Great Courses uh, a lecture on this, uh, I can't remember who the guy is, but he talks about how this is maybe America's first uh, parable of the forest, the dark woods. And, you know, like obviously Thoreau had a very different uh, idea of what, what you'd go to the woods to do. Mm -hmm. But this one's probably, I mean, definitely more historically attuned to what the Puritans thought of it as. Uh, but I, I like the, I, we'll call it the psychogeography, uh, to use a, uh, a situationist word, of, yeah, like the forest. And this, this, this appears in Scarlet Letter. It also appears in uh, Hope Leslie the forest as location of illicit activity. Yeah. And, and things that the Puritans came to create a civilization where in their minds, there was none where there was chaos essentially. And they tried to move out things that they've now either forgotten, dismissed or buried. And so they still live on in the dark woods. Basically. It was all as lonely as could be. And there is this peculiarity in such a solitude that the traveler knows not who may be concealed by the innumerable trunks and the thick boughs overhead, so that with lonely footsteps he may yet be passing through an unseen multitude. There may be a devilish Indian behind every tree, said Goodman Brown to himself, <laughs> of course. and he glanced fearfully behind him as he added, What if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? Which would be His worse. head being turned back, yeah. he passed a crook of the road, 
and, looking forward again, beheld the figure of a man, in grave and decent attire, seated at the foot of an old tree. He arose at Goodman Brown's approach, and walked onward side by side with him. "'You are late, Goodman Brown,' said he. "'The clock of the Old South was striking as I came through Boston, and that is full fifteen minutes agone.' "'Faith kept me back a while,' replied the young man, with a tremor in his voice, <laughs> on the nose. caused by yeah. the sudden appearance of his companion, though not wholly unexpected. It was now deep dusk in the forest, and deepest in that part of it where these two were journeying. As nearly as could be discerned, the second traveler was about fifty years old, apparently in the same rank of life as Goodman Brown, and bearing a considerable resemblance to him, though perhaps more in expression than features. Still, they might have been taken for father and son. And yet, though the elder person was as simply clad as the younger, and as simple in manner, too, he had an indescribable air of one who knew the world, and who would not have felt abashed at the governor's dinner table, or in King William's court, were it possible that his affairs should call him thither. So I find this interesting right away that both characters that we've met that are not Goodman Brown are aspects of our main character's psyche, essentially, that you have this wife was supposed to represent his faith and maybe to a degree his like inner soul, I guess. And then you also meet this sinister demon figure who looks just like him and is eerily similar to Could it. be an older him almost. Yeah. So he's running into, he's running into and having a dialectic with versions of himself. It seems, or he, not, maybe not versions, but aspects of himself. The other part is how this is, I think not just internally focused in the way that they bring up, you know, the the people from society that are also there. The the, like the common American book conceit is sort of thought of as the individual versus the oppressive society, mm-hmm. and you know, Scarlet Letter sort of plays into that a little bit. But I, I although I don't think it necessarily sides with Hester. We'll talk about that on that episode. The problem with those stories is it glorifies the individual in a way that like you could write those stories where the individual's values are terrible or they're great and you can still frame that uh opposition to society in pretty much the same way yeah it's in it's it's relegated to the activity of the protagonist not the reasons behind the activity i like the um the literary touches like the the demon mentioning that he was in boston like 15 minutes ago like yeah that's right he can teleport yeah that's pretty and then looking very similar to him i anything with doppelgangers i'm always like creepy and also the time that 15 minutes ago like that time as a as a thing that would will come to increasingly regiment um society Mm. uh is like that's almost uh, it almost seems more appropriate to the time hawthorne was writing this than when he actually um uh then the the setting of the story itself yeah that's a good point especially with things like the um transcontinental railroad being built in his own time Mm -hmm. but the only thing about him that could be fixed upon as remarkable was his staff which bore the likeness of a great black snake so curiously wrought that it might almost be seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent this of course must have been an ocular deception assisted by the uncertain light Mm -hmm. come goodman brown cried his fellow traveler this is a dull pace for the beginning of a journey take my staff if you are so soon weary friend said the other exchanging his slow pace for a full stop having kept covenant by meeting thee here it is my purpose now to return whence i came i have scruples touching the matter thou wotst of sayest thou so replied he of the serpent smiling apart let us walk on nevertheless reasoning as we go and if i convince thee not thou shalt turn back we are but a little way in the forest yet. Too far, too far, exclaimed the goodman, unconsciously resuming his walk. I just have to do... I don't want to make it just a tip joke, but I want to at least put that in there. It's on your mind. Anyway. <laughs> too far, too far, exclaimed the goodman, unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs. And shall I be the first of the name of Brown that ever took this path and kept? Such company, thou wouldst say, observed the elder person, 
interpreting his pause. "'Well said, Goodman Brown. I have been as well acquainted with your family as with ever a one among the Puritans, and that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem, and it was I that brought your father a pitch-pine knot, kindled at my own hearth, to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's War. This is the part where I really think this is not just about, um, this is about losing a, a sort of idea of innocence of society and the civilization mm-hmm. you're a part of. Um, I have a part, do you have anything to say about the Quakers, uh, um, chasing the Quakers thing? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, a documented and known thing, even at the time that Puritans were, uh, brutalized the Quakers, which they, there were two Christian social movements that started in England that cropped up, not at the same time, but, uh, Puritans a little bit earlier than the Quakers. And they had radically different, dis- uh, ideas on reform, what would be reforming the, uh, English church. The Puritans were much better at solidifying power. And as soon as they did, they were able to uh, cancel out the, uh, rising Quaker power pretty quickly. Mm. And, uh, regarding the, uh, the King Philip's war reference there, I have uh, from Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Uh, she goes into a bit about this uh, King Philip's War and sort of what uh, the significance of it historically. By that time, the non indigenous population of the English colony in North America had increased sixfold to more than 150,000, which meant that settlers were intruding on more of the indigenous homelands. Indigenous resistance followed in what the settlers called King Philip's War. Wampanoag people and their indigenous allies attacked the settlers' isolated farms, using a method of guerrilla warfare that relied on speed and caution in striking and retreating. The settlers scorned this kind of resistance as skulking, and responded by destroying indigenous villages, again, extirpation. But indigenous guerrilla attacks continued, and so the commander of the Plymouth Militia, Benjamin Church, studied indigenous tactics in order to develop a more effective kind of preemption. He petitioned the colony's governor for permission to choose 60 to 70 settlers to serve as scouts, as he called them, for what he termed wilderness warfare. In July 1676, the first settler-organized ranger force was the result. The rangers, 60 settlers and 140 colonized indigenous men, were to discover, pursue, fight, surprise, destroy, or subdue the enemy, in Church's words. The inclusion of indigenous fighters on the colonists' side has marked settler colonialism and foreign occupations ever since. The settler rangers could learn from their native aids and discard them. In the following two decades, Church perfected his evolving method of annihilation. Yeah, and uh, King Philip's War was uh, between 1675 and 1678. I I very much applaud Hawthorne for including those two uh, examples in... The story, because I, if it was just people going to the woods and they have, like, illicit sex and, like, do spells and stuff, that's not interesting. But if the Satanism becomes uh, geopolitical and, like, what is our society doing to sort of uh, maintain the facade that we see every day, mm-hmm. that's that's much, much more interesting. Yeah, it opens as, like, this is the... where Indians or they're his term Indians where they, yeah. where they live is essentially the devil's workshop. But now it become it. He Hawthorne muddies that water immediately by saying, well, did you know this horrible thing that your grandfather did, which happens to be uh, in it in the story's own parlance would be like, well, that would be just like slaughtering demons, but it's known as, it's seen as a very negative thing that his grandfather did. So all of a sudden it, it, it plays with symbols in a way that it, it, it's never really concrete. Mm-hmm. Walk have we had along this path and returned so smartly through the streets of Salem. And it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends, both. Just one more note on that. Setting villages on fire is literally what we did in Vietnam. Yeah. Like, that <laughs> Zippo squads, right? It's almost unbelievable. 1675. Uh, was, and that's not where we started that. I think the Pequot War is uh, what we'll talk about in Hope Leslie, maybe the first American full-on, like, 
oh yeah we're just exterminate now yeah um well, guerrilla warfare is something that we're it's just going to keep coming back to again and again and again the, the you know the longer we go down this like american history and like path. counterinsurgency and that sort mm-hmm. of thing and like yeah it's like a, they're making us do this it's basically. amazing that like god these indians are skulking the skulking way yeah. of fighting is later how we would brag about how we beat the british yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in that in that context it's prideful but also an outlier in like American activity throughout the years, like one of the maybe the only moment it's an insurgent force. Right. And many a pleasant walk have we had along this path, and returned merrily after midnight. I would fain be friends with you for their sake. If it be as thou sayest, replied Goodman Brown, I marvel they never spoke of these matters. Or verily, I marvel not, seeing that the least rumor of the sort would have driven them from New England. We are a people of prayer, and good works to boot, and abide no such wickedness. Wickedness or not, said the traveler with the twisted staff, I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. The deacons of many a church have drunk the communion wine with me. The select men of divers towns make me their chairman, and a majority of the great and general court are firm supporters of my interest. <laughs> the governor and I, too. But these are state secrets. State secrets yeah. Can this be so? cried Goodman Brown, with a stare of amazement at his undisturbed companion. Howbeit, I have nothing to do with the governor and council. They have their own ways, and are no rule for a simple husbandman like me. But, were I to go on with thee, how should I meet the eye of that good old man, our minister, at Salem Village? Oh, all the people in powerful positions, secular powerful positions, they're all compromised. Uh, But how can I face the preacher right like this is very much i think where we are in america in certain ways never before in history has it been so easy to see the nefarious things america has been doing under the the cover of darkness to maintain a certain type of global order that uh perhaps would be better than a lot of different other countries if they were the global uh empire however when you're the global empire you have to take account for the the responsibility for those sorts of things so like the this seeing that like the the all the state their state secrets that become disillusioning and how you react to that that is the most interesting lens to view this story to me well, yeah, and that there's they're laying out that Puritan New England has a double the the devil is basically pointing out that there's a double reality going on in New England. Right. There's what they do, and there's what they present. And it's interesting that Goodman Brown brings that up as a defense of his own faith right away by saying, "Well, I'm from a long history of good people." Right. So it's out. It's it's like outward displays or works, which is we'll get into that with the Scarlet Letter. Very interesting for a Protestant to be. Uh, laying claim to like, well, we have good work, so we're good people. And he, the demon, devil, whatever it is, is able to poke through that immediately. But right. then there's like, there's there's two different worlds going on. One that's being presented and one that's state secrets. And that's definitely how we understand these, uh, where we come from in a lot of these cases. Yeah. Right? Like the myths of Puritanism and the myths of um, <clears throat> like Thanksgiving, all these things are aren't the truth that aren't the whole truth by any extent of the imagination yeah like it it's as if puritism made a claim that they're going to make something that's free of all the bullshit basically that we're going to make a real society that's stripped down when in reality it's another society that's obsessed with optics i said like obsessed with pr his voice would make me tremble both sabbath day and lecture day Thus far, the elder traveler had listened with due gravity, but now burst into a fit of irrepressible mirth, shaking himself so violently that his snake-like staff actually seemed to wriggle in sympathy. Ha, 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 shouted he again and again, then composing himself. Well, go on, Goodman Brown, go on. But, prithee, don't kill me with laughing. (laughs) Well, then, to attend the matter at once, said Goodman Brown, considerably nettled. There is my wife, Faith. It would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Nay, if that be the case, answered the other, e'en go thy ways, Goodman Brown. I would not for twenty old women like the one hobbling before us that faith should come to any harm. 
As he spoke, he pointed his staff at a female figure on the path, in whom Goodman Brown recognized a very pious and exemplary dame, who had taught him his catechism in youth, and was still his moral and spiritual adviser, jointly with the minister and Deacon Gookin. A marvel, truly, that Goody Cloyce should be so far in the wilderness at nightfall, said he. But with your leave, friend, I shall take a cut through the woods until we have left this Christian woman behind. Being a stranger to you, she might ask whom I was consorting with, and whither I was going. Be it so, said his fellow traveler. Betake you to the woods, and let me keep the path. Accordingly the young man turned aside, but took care to watch his companion, who advanced softly along the road until he had come within a staff's length of the old dame. She, meanwhile, was making the best of her way, with singular speed for so aged a woman. And you know, if we were Freudian critics, we could be talking about the staff as a sort of phallic symbol, right? Oh, yeah, Wait, wriggling. <laughs> yeah, but we're not, anyway. Some indistinct words, a prayer, doubtless, as she went. The traveler put forth his staff and touched her withered neck with what seemed the serpent's tail. The devil, screamed the pious old lady. Then Goody Cloyce knows her old friend, observed the traveler, confronting her and leaning on his writhing stick. Ah, forsooth, and is it your worship indeed? I really like that little uh, reversal there. Like, it, it seems very compact, and the woman shrieks, Ah, the devil! Oh, right. And you think, like, oh, she's going to be terrified, and really she just, it's in recognition. Yeah, there you are, my yeah. best friend, Satan. Which is, like, that is, imagine if, you know, I mean, we can all imagine having this dream, right? Yeah. Like, I watched a Hereditary mm -hmm. um, in theaters a couple weeks ago. And my favorite part of those movies, and there's a similar um, part in the Paranormal Activity movies, is when they show, like, party photos of, like, witch parties in the 80s. Like, they take Polaroids. Oh, yeah, And yeah. it's, like, this this evidence of this subculture, this, like, sort of evil, dark subculture. And that stuff still sort of creeps me out a little bit. Like, yeah. that sort of documentation of uh, that. Yeah. The, it's hard. It's, it's like the uncanny, right? It, it's something that if we are being Freudian, the idea that something is deeply disturbing because it breaks a reality, but also confirms a preconceived bias that the world is actually mystical or mm. there's purpose and reason behind it. And there's active evil in the world. So it's this like double emotion happening at the same time can make you ill almost cried the good dame. Yea, truly is it. And in the very image of my old gossip, Goodman Brown, the grandfather of the silly fellow that now is, but would your worship believe it? My broomstick hath strangely disappeared, <laughs> stolen, okay, wait, as I uh, suspect. That one is a little too much, I think, for me. When she's like, I've lost my broomstick because yeah. I'm a fucking witch. And, and my black cat has <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he's just like, I can just imagine Goodman Brown, like, with his hand over his face being like, oh, I think she might be a witch. Yeah, like, he's still holding out doubt. Like, she just, she just pledged allegiance to the devil. You don't need to do any more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, but I do appreciate it as just a registering of like, okay, the witch... Which uh, cliche of uh, of having a broom? Well, also super mundane. Like, I lost my broom is not scary. There must be some domestics uh, politics thing, uh, origin of this broom, which... Yeah, I never thought thing, about that. Yeah, we'll maybe get to that on a later episode. They're not cleaning. They're busy flying exactly. around. This, instead, of the, instead of being a sort of implement of domestic uh, obedience, it's a... It's a transportation tool. Yeah. yeah. Look out, dudes. Corey. And that, too, when I was all anointed with the juice of smallage and sink foil and wool spain, mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe, said Tolerant. the shape of old Goodman Brown. Ah, your worship knows the recipe, <laughs> cried the old lady, cackling aloud. So, as I was saying, being all ready for the meeting and no horse to ride on, I made up my mind to foot it for they tell me there is a nice young man to be taken into communion tonight. Mm. But now your good worship will lend me your arm, and we shall be there in a twinkling. That can hardly be, answered her friend. I may not spare you my arm, Goody Cloyce, but here is my staff, if you will. Staff. So saying, he threw it down at her feet, where, perhaps, it assumed life, being one of the rods which its owner had formerly lent to the Egyptian magi. Of this fact, however, Goodman Brown could not take cognizance. 
he had cast up his eyes in astonishment, and, looking down again, beheld neither Goody Cloyce nor the serpentine staff, but his fellow traveler alone, who waited for him as calmly as if nothing had happened. Well, the staff is interesting because it exemplifies how Hawthorne plays with symbols, because the immediate analogy you would draw from it would be the snake in the Garden of Eden, because that makes sense, because Hawthorne, you know, he's learning about the truth about good and evil, which is that Genesis story. But then he throws in that reference to be the Egyptian magi, which then he goes to Exodus, and that's what uh, Pharaoh's magicians were able to turn their staffs into snakes when they confronted Moses and Aaron. So all of a sudden the snake represents two or three different aspects of Christian lore that have radically different implications. Mm. Yeah, he loves that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Who waited for him as calmly as if nothing had happened. That old woman taught me my catechism, said the young man, and there was a world of meaning in this simple statement. They continued to walk onward, while the elder traveler exhorted his companion to make good speed and persevere in the path, discoursing so aptly that his arguments seemed rather to spring up in the bosom of his auditor than to be suggested by himself. As they went, he plucked a branch of maple to serve for a walking stick, and began to strip it of the twigs and little boughs, which were wet with evening dew. The moment his fingers touched them, they became strangely withered and dried up as with a week's sunshine. Thus the pair proceeded, at a good free pace, until suddenly, in a gloomy hollow of the road, Goodman Brown sat himself down on the stump of a tree, and refused to go any farther. Friend, said he, stubbornly, my mind is made up. Not another step will I budge on this errand. What if a wretched old woman do choose to go to the devil when I thought she was going to heaven? Is that any reason why I should quit my dear faith and go after her? You will think better of this by and by, said his acquaintance composedly. Sit here and rest yourself a while, and when you feel like moving again, there is my staff to help you along. Without more words, he threw his companion the maple stick, and was as speedily out of sight as if he had vanished into the deepening gloom. The young man sat a few moments by the roadside, applauding himself greatly, and thinking with how clear a conscience he should meet the minister in his morning walk, nor shrink from the eye of good old Deacon Gookin. And what calm sleep would be his that very night? which was to have been spent so wickedly, but so purely and sweetly now, in the arms of faith. Amidst these pleasant and praiseworthy meditations, Goodman Brown heard the tramp of horses along the road, and deemed it advisable to conceal himself within the verge of the forest, conscious of the guilty purpose that had brought him thither, though now so happily turned from it. On came the hoof-tramps and the voices of the riders, two grave old voices, conversing soberly as they drew near. These mingled sounds appeared to pass along the road, within a few yards of the young man's hiding place, but, owing doubtless to the depth of the gloom at that particular spot, neither the travelers nor their steeds were visible. Though their figures brushed the small boughs by the wayside, it could not be seen that they intercepted, even for a moment, the faint gleam from the strip of bright sky athwart which they must have passed. Goodman Brown alternately crouched and stood on tiptoe, pulling aside the branches and thrusting forth his head as far as he durst, without discerning so much as a shadow. It vexed him the more because he could have sworn, were such a thing possible, that he recognized the voices of the minister and Deacon Gookin, jogging along quietly, as they were wont to do, when bound to some ordination or ecclesiastical council. While yet within hearing, one of the riders stopped to pluck a switch. "'Of the two, reverend sir,' said the voice like the deacons, "'I had rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting. They tell me that some of our community are to be here from Falmouth and beyond, and others from Connecticut and Rhode Island.' besides several of the Indian powwows, who, after their fashion, know almost as much deviltry as the best of us. So that, that's the second time they talk about, like, oh, I'm excited to come to the communion tonight because we're going to be, and they say, we're going to be uh, having this young man and this young woman join us. And it's this wide society, people coming from all different co parts of the colonies, mm -hmm. and uh, also in interface with Native American powwows. That those things are s tied with Satanism, I think explains a lot about the uh, Puritan consciousness. Yes. And it's interesting to think that the devil and his company are uh, very accommodating, which is not what you think of when you think of Puritan culture. You have to imagine that the initiation ceremony into a Puritan society would be a lot more strict, 
Whereas the devil's like, hey, if you need a break, you take a break. Yeah. Basically. It, the openness of the community is very interesting here. Mm-hmm. And the way that they talk about the um, bringing somebody into the congregation and the excitement that everybody has around that is very, I think, alluring, even though even though we like see him say, like, yeah, I was there when I helped your grandfather, uh, uh, you know, beat Quaker women and kill Native Americans. It's like, you know, people are excited to come join us. Mm -hmm. And when anybody, whoever you are, you hear somebody else express their desire for something, you internalize that and say, like, do I also want that? Yeah. That part is, the the way that Hawthorne uh, makes that, it's so, like, alluring um, or interesting, like, be, because you can see there's some social gravity behind the uh what's going on here it's mm-hmm. it's the most prominent people in the society uh the woman who taught him eucharist or what, what you said and everybody's excited about it and there's a sense of community so like mm-hmm. yeah it's moreover there is a goodly young woman to be taken into communion mighty well deacon gookin replied the solemn old tones of the minister oh wait spur up or we shall be late. Do you know about... The, so these these names that they're bringing up, these are historical people. Mm. I, I, I didn't know much about that other than reading that, which I think is um, an interesting move on his part, like as a form of early call-out culture. Yeah. <laughs> to say these people are in league with the devil. And he does that too with um, with the Maypole of Marymount. Like Endicott is yeah. a, uh, a real figure too. And Hawthorne's sources weren't the best. Maybe we'll play a little bit of it. Actually, do I have that right now? Anyway, yeah, basically Hawthorne, when he was at Bowdoin, read a lot of um, Puritan history, a lot of it. He graduated, and in his mid-20s, he was sort of like a struggling writer, living with his uh, mother. Um, His his dad died when he was younger, uh, and he was a marine sort of privateer type figure. You can't tell what, what Hawthorne would have intended, but it seems like colonial New England and Puritan New England weighed heavily uh, on him, like what they did and what they went through in a way that I know it's a significant departure uh, historically, but at this moment, the Salem witch trials are largely a um, uh, tourist destination now, like mm-hmm. these like dressed up like witches and stuff like that. Like the way he talked about, or the, the way they talked about history uh, like the pain of history resting on these characters and resting on him reminds me of how we talk about the civil war now. Mm-hmm. How it's not necessarily over, that there's still aspects of it that are potent even today. Yeah. And I think even more broadly, like this is what Hawthorne sort of about is these, uh, inheritances from the past. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I said, how was the seven Gables explicitly? So why? Well, yeah. I think if, w- if I had to nail down what, <laughs> what is sinful about or what's wicked about Goodman Brown's journey into the forest is that he's going into the book of history. Like he's mm-hmm. opening up what really happened when he wasn't there right? and seeing his parents and his um, grandfather and all his mentors. Yeah. And getting to see them clearly like from like a, a God level perspective and how that can destroy uh, your understanding of the world, basically. Right. Nothing can be done, you know, until I get on the ground. The hoofs clattered again, and the voices, talking so strangely in the empty air, passed on through the forest, where no church had ever been gathered, or solitary Christian prayed. Whither, then, could these holy men be journeying so deep into the heathen wilderness? Young Goodman Brown caught hold of a tree for support, being ready to sink down on the ground, faint and overburdened, with the heavy sickness of his heart. He looked up to the sky, doubting whether there really was a heaven above him. Yet there was the blue arch and the stars brightening in it. With heaven above and faith below, I will yet stand firm against the devil, cried Goodman Brown. While he still gazed upward into the deep arch of the firmament and had lifted his hands to pray, a cloud, though no wind was stirring, hurried across the zenith and hid the brightening stars. The blue sky was still visible, except directly overhead, where this black mass of cloud was sweeping swiftly northward. Aloft in the air, as if from the depths of the cloud, 
came a confused and doubtful sound of voices. Once the listener fancied that he could distinguish the accents of townspeople of his own, men and women, both pious and ungodly, many of whom he had met at the communion table, and had seen others riding at the tavern. The next moment, so indistinct were the sounds, he doubted whether he had heard aught but the murmur of the old forest, whispering without a wind. Then came a stronger swell of those familiar tones, heard daily in the sunshine at Salem Village, but never until now from a cloud of night. There was one voice of a young woman, uttering lamentations, yet with an uncertain sorrow, and entreating for some favor, which, perhaps, it would grieve her to obtain, and all the unseen multitude, both saints and sinners, seemed to encourage her onward. Faith! shouted Goodman Brown, in a voice of agony and desperation, and the echoes of the forest mocked him, crying, Faith! Faith! as if bewildered wretches were seeking her all through the wilderness. The cry of grief, rage, and terror was yet piercing the night, when the unhappy husband held his breath for a response. There was a scream, drowned immediately in a louder murmur of voices, fading into far-off laughter, as the dark cloud swept away, leaving the clear and silent sky above Goodman Brown. It's a pretty interesting and trippy little scene there. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't, it's, it's just, it just strikes me as good. Like, uh, Stephen King on the Wikipedia um, page for Young Goodman Brown, he, he cites this as his favorite Hawthorne story. Yeah. And I actually, like, after reading that, it makes perfect sense to me. Oh, yeah. For a story that's meant to be, or lays itself out in the beginning as an allegory, it is smart enough to play with your um, bearings as a reader of like wh- what's happening where what's happening when keeps shifting mm. and the reality of the situation you can't really trust it which I think sometimes allegory they can become so rigid that, that you know yeah. what's going to happen yeah like th- well yeah like this represents this and this represents that whereas Hawthorne I think is smart enough to kind of play with um, those symbols right. but something fluttered lightly down through the air and caught on the branch of a tree the young man seized it and beheld a pink ribbon My faith is gone. (laughs) As as soon as I said that. (laughs) After one stupefied moment. There is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given. And, maddened with despair, so that he laughed loud and long, did Goodman Brown grasp his staff and set forth again. There is no good in... uh, What is it? Let's see. There is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. That reminds me of that Shakespeare... uh, quote uh hell is empty and all the devils are here oh yeah 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 it Mm -hmm. reminded me of this whole story reminds me a lot of mark twain's last book the mysterious stranger Mm. and the devil has this monologue at the end says you were but a thought a vagrant thought wandering the universe uh very similar to that like there's no there's no anything which you know kind of seems paradoxical to me because i feel like if i got an affirmation that the devil existed right I would think, oh, okay, well, then God definitely exists. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't think like, oh, fuck, it's the devil. It's yeah. Not- the devil's right. Damn there it. is nothing true except yeah, for exactly. his existence would suggest otherwise. The supernatural being is right that this is, there's nothing extra out there. <laughs> yeah, and I definitely think that's what Hawthorne's playing at. That mm-hmm. it's like, what we were talking about earlier about the binary nature of Puritanism. It's amazing how quickly he turns into a nihilist. Within, I mean, within yes. moments of discovering that his uh, grandfather wasn't what he is and that the woman who taught him his catechism isn't who she is, she's a witch, he's like, oh, okay, then there is no sin <laughs> and there's no point to anything. I'm going to scream like a maniac in the forest. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given. And, maddened with despair, so that he laughed loud and long, did Goodman Brown grasp his staff and set forth again at such a rate that he seemed to fly along the forest path rather than to walk or run. The road grew wilder and drearier and more faintly traced. And that uh, he appeared to fly and not to run. That, like, is that is there some supernatural going on here? Or is that just the appearance of it? That also comes up a lot in Scarlet Letter. Yeah. Anished at length, leaving him in the heart of the dark wilderness, still rushing onward with the instinct that guides mortal men to evil. The whole forest was peopled with frightful sounds, the creaking of the trees, the howling of wild beasts, and the yell of Indians, while sometimes the wind tolled like a distant church bell, 
and sometimes gave a broad roar around the traveler, as if all nature were laughing him to scorn. But he was himself the chief horror of the scene, and shrank not from its other horrors. Ha! 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 roared Goodman Brown when the wind laughed at him. Let us hear which will laugh loudest. Think not to frighten me with your deviltry. Come, witch, come, wizard, come, Indian powwow, come, devil himself, and here comes Goodman Brown. You may as well fear him as he fear you. In truth, all through the haunted forest there could be nothing more frightful than the figure of Goodman Brown. On he flew among the black pines, brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures, now giving vent to an inspiration of horrid blasphemy, and now shouting forth such laughter as set all the echoes of the forest laughing like demons around him. The fiend in his own shape is less hideous than when he rages in the breast of man. Thus sped the demoniac on his course, until, quivering among the trees, he saw a red light before him, as when the felled trunks and branches of a clearing have been set on fire and throw up their lurid blaze against the sky at the hour of midnight. He paused, in a lull of the tempest that had driven him onward, and heard the swell of what seemed to him, rolling solemnly from a distance with the weight of many voices. He knew the tune. It was a familiar one in the choir of the village meeting house. The verse died heavily away, and was lengthened by a chorus, not of human voices, but of all the sounds of the benighted wilderness pealing in awful harmony together. Goodman Brown cried out, and his cry was lost to his own ear by its unison with the cry of the desert. In the interval of silence he stole forward until the light glared full upon his eyes. At one extremity of an open space, hemmed in by the dark wall of the forest, arose a rock, bearing some rude natural resemblance either to an altar or a pulpit, and surrounded by four blazing pines, their tops aflame, their stems untouched, like candles at an evening meeting. The mass of foliage that had overgrown the summit of the rock was all on fire, blazing high into the night and fitfully illuminating the whole field. Each pendant twig and leafy festoon was in a blaze. As the red light arose and fell, a numerous congregation alternately shone forth, then disappeared in shadow, and again grew, as it were, out of the darkness, peopling the heart of the solitary woods at once. A grave and dark-glad company, quoth Goodman Brown. In truth, they were such. Among them, quivering to and fro between gloom and splendor, appeared faces that would be seen next day at the council board of the province, and others which, Sabbath after Sabbath, looked devoutly heavenward and benignantly over the crowded pews from the holiest pulpits in the land. Some affirmed that the lady of the governor was there. At least there were high dames well known to her, and wives of honored husbands, and widows, and a great multitude, and ancient maidens, a lot of women, all of excellent say. repute, yeah. and fair young girls well, who trembled lest their mothers should spy them. When it comes to the devil. Yeah. Either the sudden gleams of light flashing over the obscure field bedazzled Goodman Brown, or he recognized a score of the church members of Salem Village, famous for their especial sanctity. Good old Deacon Gookin had arrived, and waited at the skirts of that venerable saint, his revered pastor. But, irreverently consorting with these grave, reputable, and pious persons, these elders of the church, these chaste dames and dewy virgins. There were men of dissolute lives and women of spotted fame. Dewy virgins is a... Never heard it before. Don't think I want to hear it again. Disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like within... It's actually almost worse than doughy virgins. <laughs> I think it is, yeah. yeah. Sweaty. Wretches given over to all mean and filthy vice and suspected even of horrid crimes. It was strange to see that the good shrank not from the wicked, nor were the sinners abashed by the saints. Scattered also among their pale-faced enemies or the Indian priests, or powwows, who had often scared their native forest with more hideous incantations than any known to English witchcraft. Okay, so the idea that the powwows... He's powwows, really, really lading his cards out now. I, I, I think about this every once in a while. It's like, if, especially in the context of like Puritans thinking Native Americans had this sort of scary magic... Imagine if they fucking did, how different history would be. It'd be fucking <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I, I am citing this correctly. There's like a rain dancer. There, towards the later, like in the last decade of the 19th century, there was a big in Dakota Territory uh, Native Americans that were 
doing these dances that like we're gonna be in it's gonna make us invincible sort of thing yeah right? i can't remember it's like i wish that was true it'd be yeah. fucking awesome yeah i like the touch of like it's even worse than our witches in europe and it's just like you just can't get over it can you it's yeah. like every time you go somewhere that's like the person right next to you they're just like oh my god this person is horrifying yeah like a, a scary thing yeah, yeah exactly even out the match a little bit but where's faith thought goodman brown and as hope came into his heart he trembled another verse of the hymn arose a slow and mournful strain such as the pious love but joined to words which expressed all that our nature can conceive of sin and darkly hinted at far more unfathomable to mere mortals is the lore of fiends verse after verse was sung and still the chorus of the desert swelled between like the deepest tone of a mighty organ and with the final peal of that dreadful anthem there came a sound as if the roaring wind the rushing streams the howling beasts and every other voice of the unconcerted wilderness were mingling and according with the voice of guilty man in homage to the prince of all the four blazing pines threw up a loftier flame and obscurely discovered shapes and visages of horror on the smoke wreaths above the impious assembly at the same moment the fire on the rock shot redly forth and formed a glowing arch above its base where now appeared a figure with reverence be it spoken the figure bore no slight similitude both in garb and manner to some grave divine of the new england churches bring forth the converts cried a voice that echoed through the field and rolled into the forest at the word goodman brown stepped forth from the shadow of the trees and approached the congregation with whom he felt a loathful brotherhood by the sympathy of all that was wicked in his heart he could have well nigh sworn that the shape of his own dead father beckoned him to advance looking downward from a smoke wreath while a woman with dim features of despair threw out her hand to warn him back was it his mother but he had no power to retreat one step nor to resist even in thought when the minister and good old deacon gookin seized his arms and led him to the blazing rock thither came also the slender form of a veiled female led between goody cloyce that pious teacher of the catechism and martha carrier who had received the devil's promise to be queen of hell nice a rampant hag was she <laughs> <laughs> there stood the proselytes beneath the so personal what does that even mean <laughs> yeah a, a rampant hag was she is it like a hag that just get like has been flying around all of New England, so everyone knows she's a hag. She's like rampant, not wet, or just like unrelenting in her hagging everybody. Yeah, I guess what's what would be frustrating for the modern reader is it starts out in a way that speaks to our modern sympathies of like you shouldn't commit genocide or like you shouldn't persecute people for being witches because that's ridiculous, and then it makes a sharp turn, which it in the story where he aligns himself with the devil and he finds out that his teacher is a witch, that the great sin of the Salem witch trials was not the fact that they were persecuting people for being quote unquote witches. It's that they got the wrong people mm. that witchcraft is real and Satanism is real. They just happened to, uh, they got the wrong ones. Mm. That, that's my reading of this. Anyway, he said it, it kind of, I understand that it's of its own place and its own time, but it's like as a modern reader, at that point it falls flat of what it could have, what I was assuming it would be, or, or the possibility of what it could have been. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. Welcome, my children, said the dark figure, to the communion of your race. Ye have found thus young your nature and your destiny. My children, look behind you. They turned, and flashing forth, as it were, in a sheet of flame, the fiend worshippers were seen. The smile of welcome gleamed darkly on every visage. There, resumed the sable form, are all whom ye have reverenced from youth. <laughs> ye deemed them holier than yourselves, and shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with their lives of righteousness and prayerful aspirations heavenward. Yet here are they all in my worshipping assembly. This night it shall be granted you to know their secret deeds, how hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households. Grab them by the pussy. <laughs> How many a woman, eager for widow's weeds, has given her husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. Okay, that's nuts. How beardless... To all the women who have poisoned their husbands? Yeah. And what the hell? Yeah. Youths have made haste to inherit their father's wealth. And how fair damsels, plush not sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden and bidden me, the sole guest, to an infant's funeral. By the sympathy of your human hearts for sin, ye shall scent out all the places, whether in church, 
bedchamber, street, field, or forest, where crime has been committed, and shall exult to behold the whole earth one stain of guilt, one mighty blood spot. Far more than this, it shall be yours to penetrate in every bosom the deep mystery of sin, the fountain of all wicked arts, and which inexhaustibly supplies more evil impulses than human power, than my power at its utmost can make manifest in deeds. And now, my children, look upon each other. They did so, and, by the blaze of the hell-kindled torches, the wretched man beheld his faith, and the wife her husband, trembling before that unhallowed altar. Lo, there ye stand, my children, said the figure in a deep and solemn tone, almost sad with its despairing awfulness, as if his once angelic nature could yet mourn for our miserable race. Depending upon one another's hearts, ye had still hoped that virtue were not all a dream. Now are ye undeceived. Evil is the nature of mankind. Evil must be your only happiness. Welcome again, my children, to the communion of your race. Welcome, repeated the fiend worshippers, in one cry of despair and triumph. And there they stood, the only pair, as it seemed, who were yet hesitating on the verge of wickedness in this dark world. A basin was hollowed, naturally, in the rock. Did it contain water, reddened by the lurid light? Or was it blood? Or, perchance, a liquid flame? Herein did the shape of evil dip his hand. And I like that touch. I, I like the idea of him being it, playing with symbols again, talking about blood and what I assume be baptizing in blood, which is exact. That's, that's straight up Christian doctrine, be washed in the blood of the lamb. But this is like a, a witch's Sabbath, so it's the same um, symbol, but from a different background. Like it's, it sounds like it could be like the blood of history or something. There's a lot of that sort of duality, like the the way that they refer to the prince, right? Mm-hmm. And and Jesus also referred to as the prince, maybe less now than at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure, but 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 definitely like the devil is constantly referred to as the prince. Yeah, and that the devil essentially is a Puritan of just with a different uh, outwardly, just with different beliefs. Like, he still follows this, like, ex- uh, ritual. They still do rituals. Yeah, exa- so which is almost identical. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just that they happen to be, like, they're praying to something different, to wickedness. <laughs> or was it blood? Or, perchance, a liquid flame? Herein did the shape of evil dip his hand, and prepare to lay the mark of baptism upon their foreheads, that they might be partakers of the mystery of sin, more conscious of the secret guilt of others, both in deed and thought, than they could now be of their own. The husband cast one look at his pale wife, and faith at him. What polluted wretches would the next glance show them to each other, shuddering alike at what they disclosed, and what they saw? Faith! Faith! cried the husband. Look up to heaven, and resist the wicked one. Whether faith obeyed he knew not. Hardly had he spoken when he found himself amid calm night and solitude, listening to a roar of the wind which died heavily away through the forest. He staggered against the rock, and felt it chill and damp, while a hanging twig, that had been all on fire, besprinkled his cheek with the coldest dew. The next morning young Goodman Brown came slowly into the street of Salem Village, staring around him like a bewildered man. The good old minister was taking a walk along the graveyard to get an appetite for breakfast and meditate his sermon, and bestowed a blessing, as he passed, on Goodman Brown. He shrank from the venerable... That's such a, that's such like an eighties movie quality to it. It's like, are you okay? Yeah. And they're just like, duh, 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 duh. or just like, what, what, what year is it? The exact same sort of thing happens in Scarlet Letter when mm-hmm. Dimsdale and Hester have a meeting in the woods, mm-hmm. and he comes back and he wants to like whisper blasphemies into like followers of his church. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hell isn't real, you weirdo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or just like, yeah, this guy just had. A uh, horrific supernatural occurrence, and there's this guy who's just completely ignorant and bliss. Like, I'm gonna work up this uh, appetite for breakfast and work on my sermon. And God bless you, good man. <laughs> and and yeah, young Goodman Brown just goes Satan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is like it's like I was just dipped in the blood of Satan. Double <laughs> saint, as if to avoid an anathema. Old Deacon Gookin was at domestic worship, and the holy words of his prayer were heard through the open window. What God doth the wizard pray to? Quoth Goodman Brown. 
Goody Cloyce, that excellent old Christian, stood in the early sunshine at her own lattice, catechizing a little girl who had brought her a pint of morning's milk. Goodman Brown snatched away the child as from the grasp of the fiend himself. Turning the corner by the meeting-house, he spied the head of Faith, with the pink ribbons, gazing anxiously forth, and bursting into such joy at sight of him that she skipped along the street and almost kissed her husband before the whole village. But Goodman Brown looked sternly and sadly into her face, and passed on without a greeting. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest, and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch-meeting? Be it so if he will, but, alas, it was a dream of evil omen for young Goodman Brown. A stern, a sad, a darkly meditative, a distrustful, if not a desperate man did he become from the night of that fearful dream. On the Sabbath day, when the congregation were singing a holy psalm, he could not listen because an anthem of sin rushed loudly upon his ear and drowned all the blessed strain. When the minister spoke from the pulpit with power and fervid eloquence, and, with his hand on the open Bible, of the sacred truths of our religion, and of saint-like lives and triumphant deaths, and of future bliss or misery unutterable, then did Goodman Brown turn pale, dreading lest the roof should thunder down upon the gray blasphemer and his hearers. Often, waking suddenly at midnight, he shrank from the bosom of faith, and at morning or evening tide, when the family knelt down at prayer, he scowled and muttered to himself, and gazed sternly at his wife, and turned away. Jesus. And when he had lived long, Pain in the ass. and was born to his grave a hoary corpse, followed by faith, <laughs> the road grew wilder and drearier and more faintly traced, and vanished at length, leaving him in the heart of the dark wilderness. Still rushing onward with the instinct, had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest? When the minister spoke from the pulpit with power, and deaths, and of future bliss or misery unutterable, then did Goodman Brown turn pale, dreading lest the roof should thunder down upon the gray blasphemer and his hearers. Often, waking suddenly at midnight, he shrank from the bosom of faith, and at morning or evening tide, when the family knelt down at prayer, he scowled and muttered to himself, and gazed sternly at his wife, and turned away. And when he had lived long, and was born to his grave a hoary corpse, followed by faith an aged woman, and children and grandchildren, a goodly procession, besides neighbors not a few, they carved no hopeful verse upon his tombstone, for his dying hour was gloom. The end of Young Goodman Brown. It's quite the ambiguous ending. Yeah. Or, as far as what you're supposed to take away, this I feel like I felt a number of different ways about how that syncs up with the rest of the story. My initial response was that that's the price of enlightenment is that you're alone, mm. that you don't get it. You don't get to go along with the lie like the rest of Salem, New England. Right. And, you know, the education has that kind of effect on you, especially learning history, especially learning history of people that are near you, that you can't unsee or unlearn things. And it makes him, like, self-segregate from society. Which is maybe, that's, like, what the lure of the devil is in that story. That's like, yeah, we're all committing sin, but we all belong to something. Right. And Goodman Brown is doesn't even get to enjoy <laughs> seemingly anything after that. Like, a, an oversimplification would say this is, like, a sort of curiosity killed the cat story. Right. Um, and, yeah, I think it is sort of... <clears throat> it, de- it definitely plays... You can have a reading where this is actually like a, a sort of whistleblowing type of thing, or yeah. it's a sort of don't go looking at things you shouldn't be, you're not prepared to understand uh, yeah, sort of thing. And I, I think Hawthorne, especially when we know Hawthorne's conservatism, I think both readings are fairly justified. Yeah, I think so. I, there, Terry Eggl, Eggleton, I think is his name, just wrote a short book on radical sacrifice and he there was a chapter where he discussed a lot about how barbarity and society are actually two sides of the same coin more often than not mm. that barbarity upholds society and i think that this story dovetails into that sentiment very nicely right that in goodman brown's consciousness the 
evil and wickedness is out in the dark forest but in reality this it's just a the flip of a it's like the the opposite end of society not the opposite end it's just all the players in society are are there and they all feel very welcome there and when they're in the light of day that's when they're pretending and that's when they're fake and i feel like it's a it's a positive thing that you know the way like all the things that are sort of under this satanic umbrella here um from the like uh oppression of different sort of uh oppressed groups Mm -hmm. like uh quakers or uh, native americans it it sort of puts um things like maybe sexual dalliance and uh weird rituals along and that you don't understand often like maybe native american rituals uh into the same bucket as these sorts of real oppression things and yeah, I mean, it is nice to be in a, a different time where, say, like two men sleeping with each other isn't interpreted as a sign of the devil. Yeah, it was actually much more mundane than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the amount of things you wouldn't understand, especially as a Puritan, is off the scale. Like, there, it's not a surprise that this is a community that went insane with uh, the witch trials. Mm-hmm. Um, this is in like one of the main things you look for in a cult is uh, a sort of management of what communications and information that the members hear, mm-hmm. and especially at this time in history, like it was a, it was difficult to not be in a cult yeah. in a certain uh, respect. Uh, let's go to a little bit more of this. Uh, um, I want to play this University of Houston uh, Wood. Uh, lecture on Hawthorne that we went to a little bit because he, he really uh, tees off on uh, on young Goodman Brown in a way that I found kind of uh, amusing. Now, I've said that young Goodman Brown is a naive young man. Uh, he's supposedly a good man, as his name would suggest, but his fateful journey into the forest is naively stupid. <laughs> Here, for instance, Go off. Um, yeah. he says, My love and my faith, of all nights in the year, this one night must I tarry away from thee. My journey must needs be done twixt now and sunrise. Um, it's been suggested that this, of all nights in the year, uh, one critic, I think, I guess it's Harry Levin, uh, suggested that this is probably October 31st. Uh, which is what All Hallows Eve, Halloween comes from. Interesting because that um, that particular evil night goes back uh, finally into um, into Catholicism. But this is something that has survived into Protestantism. Um, but certainly he's he's um, naive. He's taking chances in being tempting tempted. Um, you know he's turning over his fate into the powers of evil. And, um, and then he seems, what's odd about it is, having done this himself, he seems so naive that he doesn't expect that other people will do the same. He's quite surprised to see all these good citizens out there. <laughs> he's a good citizen, I suppose. He thinks of himself as a good citizen, yet he's kind of surprised to see all the other good citizens of Salem out there in the forest doing what he's doing. And, and these words, of course, uh, quoted here um, to his wife are naive and condescending. Say thy prayers, dear faith, and go to bed at dusk, and no harm will come to thee. Uh, and his subsequent, subsequently expressed belief that after this one night he can cling to faith, faith skirts and follow her to heaven also seems uh, foolhardy and, and naive. He's tampering in, within a Puritan system, and I realize this, this may not make a whole uh, a huge mark upon a 20th century reader, but within the Puritan system he is tampering with his eternal salvation here. That's clear. If you get within the context of the story, which we need to do when we read Hawthorne. Those are stakes, I think, are very hard to relate to. Yeah. Um, that like, oh, fuck, I just fucked this up. And if they weren't hard to relate to, I wouldn't be going into the fucking woods. Yeah. Like, well, it's thoroughly, I mean, and the story is thoroughly Puritan in that sense, where you can't dabble with sin. You either are elect or you're damned. And that, that may have been Goodman Brown's fatal premise that he thought he could like just you know i just want to i just want to check it out i just want to see what it looks like and i'll leave and hawthorne was like no but also the weird thing of i don't want anybody else to have done this yeah either which is like that that reminds me of like the sort of 
um, anti-gay preachers that turn out to be yeah. gay, like that sort of like self-hating uh, response. Well, that dichotomy was already living in Goodman Brown before he went to the forest. That he wants to be seen as something much different than what he is, right? Like he, in multiple parts in the story, he's terrified to find out that someone would see him. Mm, yeah. And then also his wife's faith, his wife, Faith, um, her, one of the few allegories I like is her pink ribbon that keeps coming up. Which is similar to like, the, he likes these signifiers, like the minister's black veil, the scarlet letter, mm-hmm. the pink ribbon, the, the things Maple. that like, often, I mean, in this case, like textiles uh, of a specific color mm-hmm. that meaning can be assigned to. Yeah. Yeah, I... It's a, it's a good image for someone like Goodman Brown because it, it's an outward signifier that I'm this kind of person, you know, I'm a Puritan, and how quickly it's a, it, I mean, his faith is hanging by a thread, literally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And as soon as that thread pops off her hat, it's gone. I want to play just a little bit more from the wine apple. <clears throat> uh, this is from her actual autobiography, the book. This is when Hawthorne was his sort of education. Uh, he's, he's, like I said, he's in his mid to late 20s. He writes a book when he's about 28 called like Fanshawe, which he later uh, burns and repudiates and doesn't mention. His wife literally didn't know he wrote it until after Hawthorne died. Jesus. Um, just to stay on um, Young Goodman Brown. Young Goodman Brown was written 1835 anonymously in the New England magazine. In 1837, he came out with Twice Told Tales, which is what the Maple and Marymount is right. that we read and also Minister Black Veil and a few others. He did not include this in that collection. And the speculation is that it was too uh, sort of autobiographically revealing or he thought it was too early or there's some sort of reason he didn't want to include this story. Uh, he later included it into uh, Mosses from an Old Manse. Hmm. That you wouldn't choose this is an interesting choice to me. Mm-hmm. Here's um, Brenda Wineapple a little bit on his... Uh, um, relationship to uh, well here he is on his relationship to the past Nathaniel rummaged among the dusty wools and papers carefully preserved in Salem initiating genealogical and antiquarian investigations that lasted a lifetime identifying with the ancient Hathorns in his imaginative life he began to underplay his connection to the Mannings if he didn't much like his father's side of the family reputedly he told a friend he wanted no connection to them he begrudgingly admired their self-regarding vanity so different from the secular strivings of blacksmiths and bookkeepers as a consequence, he relentlessly perused old documents in pursuit of something more personal than source material, patrimony, the kind taken for granted by his college friends. With a self-assurance he did not share, men like Frank Pierce or Stephen Longfellow and they were not exceptional could lean on or rebel against living fathers of distinction and marked descent. Hathorne had the descent, not the distinction. His own father had died without rejuvenating the ancestral name. Yet a shabby gentility was better than none, and so Nathaniel carried himself with the melancholy claw of a young lord burdened by inconsolable loss. Yeah, so that there's the Hawthorne sort of uh, hmm. in his late twenties reacting like his fa- like I said his father died when he was young. Um, I I think that plays into and we don't have Hawthorne's letters to Melville. We only have Mel- Melville's letter to Hawthorne, but I think that's why Hawthorne was interested in Melville because uh, yeah. he was a seafaring guy sort of thing. And and uh, uh, Hawthorne a number of I mean he went to Liverpool. He he got around, but he also felt like when he was in Salem. He was sort of trapped, and there's a different life from people who are on the sea versus on uh, landlocked, basically. Hmm. Um, but uh, here he is, uh, is a bit later, and this takes us actually to uh, the production of uh, Young Goodman Brown. The, uh, the the token that's referenced here is a, is an interesting sort of publication thing where it's like a gift book that comes out in the holiday season hmm. uh, in the month, and Hawthorne would occasionally have a couple uh, of short stories in there was resolved not to declare himself until the curiosity and enthusiasm aroused by his anonymous writings had reached such a pitch as to render concealment no longer possible. This way he'd save himself embarrassment by bounding, as it were, onto the literary scene, without an audience for his work having been established. It was a calculation, savvy, and self-protective and fully in keeping with the pose of author as the gentleman on the steeple-top who didn't write for money. Hawthorne wasn't successful. He'd planned to bring out Fanshawe, said Ebe, to whet the public's appetite for seven tales, but the novel had not sold and the tales went uncollected. So too the manuscript of Provincial Tales, which probably languished in Goodrich's drawer, especially since he could make use of individual stories in the token. Of course, Hawthorne consented to carving it up, what choice did he have? He must have wondered. He gave Goodrich the gentle boy, my kinsman, Major Molyneux, Roger Malvin's burial, and the wives of the dead for the 1832 token, published at the end of 1831. And perhaps he justified the decision. 
the antiquarian Joseph B. Felt had brought out the very popular Annals of Salem in 1827, and in 1831 both John Greenleaf Whittier's Legends of New England and Delia Bacon's Tales of the Puritans appeared. The field was small and crowded. But with Goodrich still eager for more material, Hawthorne was launched after a fashion, and none too soon. In 1831 he turned 27. Eve said he had not expected to live to be 25. I nourished a regretful desire to be summoned early from the scene, he wrote in mock retrospect, explaining that he who has a part in the serious business of life, though it be only as a shoemaker, feels himself equally respectable in youth and age, and therefore is content to live. It is far otherwise with the busy idlers of the world. Yet not three years after the publication of Fanshawe, Hawthorne wanted to expunge it from his past. It mortified him. So he got hold of Eve's copy, which she never saw again, and at Hawthorne's request Horatio Bridge destroyed his. Hawthorne's wife would never even learn of Fanshawe's existence until after his death. An avid reader, Hawthorne carefully assessed the work of his competitors Eve recalled him studying a great many novels and, in particular, works by women writers, those ink-stained Amazons who, he feared, could bump their male rivals right out of the field, petticoats triumphant. The terms are Hawthorne's, and they appear <laughs> in the introductory paragraph of his historical sketch Mrs. Hutchinson, published in the Salem Gazette in December 1830. Hawthorne was using Mrs. Hutchinson to some extent to inveigh against women writers and the troubling question of feminine ambition. His argument goes like this, at present there are no women quite like the brave Anne Hutchinson, an antinomian banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for preaching, especially at her trial, that God communicated by direct revelation, she needed no priestly interlocutors, or patriarchs, to parcel out God's word. These days, says Hawthorne, contemporary women exploit the popular press, not an apostate church, as the medium through which feminine ambition chiefly manifests itself. The phenomenon, however, isn't entirely positive. To be any good as a writer, a woman must sacrifice a part of the loveliness of her sex, Hawthorne declares, and she is obliged to expose her naked mind to the gaze of the world, with indications by which its inmost secrets may be searched out. Authorship, then, implies public exposure, unbecoming, improper, and shameful. Or, from another point of view, why should women have to endure the various trials that authors undergo, Hawthorne wonders with facetious gallantry. The condescension is obvious, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. but the issue is personal. Yeah. Hawthorne is reflecting on the choices he's made, or has felt compelled to make, having taken up a profession storytelling fraught with insecurity, vanity, and humiliation, a profession regarded as irresponsible and disreputable and likely to become even more so if women successfully enter it. That would prove that fiction is a kind of women's work, decorative and useless, an idler's trade, not a manly one. It is one of my few sources of pride, Hawthorne defended himself in another context, that, ridiculous as the object was, I followed it up with the firmness and energy of a man. If the writer is a pariah, he is also a hero of sorts ironically like Anne Hutchinson, who emerges in Hawthorne's sketch as pilloried and yet grand, intelligent, standing unafraid before her judges with a flash of carnal pride half hidden in her eye. However, he has to make sure that she, as his signal female courageous, smart, and sexy does not best him. For she is not only complex but composite, a version of Eve, a version of his mother, the widow who for a time ventured a different life, and something of himself as author, surmounting inhibitions and relinquishing the immunities of a private character, as he admits elsewhere, and giving every man, and for money, too, the right, of treating me with open scorn. But Mrs. Hutchinson accepted, in most of Hawthorne's early tales and sketches women function largely as cardboard props in which Hawthorne is not invested, the damsel in distress, Fanshawe, The Anguished Wife, in Roger Malvin's Burial, Innocence Wronged, Alice Doan's Appeal, and, inevitably, Temptation, The Woman with a Scarlet Petticoat in My Kinsman, Major Molyneux. Though peopled with stock women, these stories nonetheless shiver with a phantom sexuality, fearsome and inappropriate. Funeral bells toll at marriages, strange old spinsters interrupt wedding ceremonies, loving husbands intend to kill their loving wives, and a young minister dons a black veil for no apparent reason. In the particularly fine young Goodman Brown, marital bliss sours after the newlywed Brown deserts his wife, Faith, for a night's frolic in the woods, losing his moral virginity and, one infers, his sexual innocence. But unable to confront his own desires, more subversive than he knew, young Goodman Brown cannot endure anyone else's, and he returns to the village a harried man, condemned for his squeamishness to a lonely, desperate death. It will not be the first time that the Hawthorne character comes home trapped, confused, and lonely. Yeah, that really exposes a lot of Hawthorne's uh, psyche, and it's interesting because you know, we're we're in this moment of, um, you know, you have people like Dave Rubin, um, Jordan Peterson talking about how the SJWs are drowning out conversation, right? Yeah. Um, this podcast is actually going to show that that's a bunch of bullshit because we are going to spend a lot of time on uh, writers and even uh, at times applauding their work. Uh, who their politics fucking suck, mm -hmm. and they even for their time they were and I and I think Hawthorne is uh, Hawthorne is very interesting to me because he strikes me as the like if I was a conservative it would have been in this way yeah I don't necessarily want to defend all the things that are being done but I also think that it might be some sort of 
uh, you know, divine plan or something. Right? Natural law. Yeah. The, and that's like one of the more time-tested tropes and get into it being like, uh, why shouldn't women be authors? Like, because being an author sucks. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to help you, okay? I love women. I'm putting them on a pedestal. Like, like what I'm doing here, it sucks. You yeah. know, it's just like the stupidest fucking argument. And, like, that's something you could walk down the street and hear today easily. Be like, I love women. I protect women. You know, and that's why I don't want them being the president or being or i don't know being in an office with me so basically um compare this to the maypole on marymount do you think this is a more interesting story yeah i think there's i think the it tackles some of the same themes and the idea of society and how society grows and changes largely from what i can gather negatively for hawthorne that society ossifies and um, become sick really quickly. And I think for Hawthorne, he would, based on these two stories, that's unavoidable. It's just mm-hmm. a natural part of the process, and it has to keep going in that way. Uh, so it both is, it's both like a critical look at society, which is, that's the part that's exciting to read. Yeah. But then the second half of the story is always like, and that's essentially the only way we can exist. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is yeah. like well that's just hopeless and also self-fulfilling yeah yeah it's like it, a puritan that's mad that the puritans aren't doing it more puritanically right someone who has sort of i think base and unenlightened and really like not even to me don't seem terribly well reflected upon it, uh political opinions can when they are creating art make something that's actually much interrogates those things with a lot more uh incisiveness yeah like I, like i i think scarlet letter probably has a liberatory effect on most of the readers yeah even though i think when we read that the conclusions aren't necessarily liberatory like like it, it, it isn't a happy ending story and the same thing with this is like you can see hawthorne uh aware of certain sort of societal ills that we would be aware of now Mm -hmm. um but he's interested in them as sort of timeless uh, unsolvable problems and a lot of his pathos comes from accepting that yeah uh and and that is as a window to the the uh conservative sort of middle class imagination uh i think hawthorne is is really actually uh as talented of a writer as his reputation is. And the interesting thing about him is he was always popular. He was never like, he was never, he was selling a fraction to what like Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, wrote, which is why he's so resentful of women like her. Um, But there was never a point from that point forward where he was out of the curriculum. Yeah. I think there's one of the benefits of maybe unforeseen benefits of him being able to be so, agile with symbols and stories is that's something that can give your writing a lasting quality mm-hmm. because you get to bring to his stories your own worldview and you can kind of fill in those gaps of what represents what and one thing you learn and one thing hawthorne i think learned from reading history is that symbols do change yeah they don't stay the same over time i think yeah there's something interesting about in the couple of books that we've read that America still has a new idea as its own nation that they kind of had to grab these writers. These writers had to grapple with the idea of their home was one thing. It was a colony of England within living memory. And now it's its own nation. Mm -hmm. And they had to live through a symbolic change of their own homeland. And I think that that's reflected in the spy. And I think it's reflected in Hawthorne's works. And it's an interesting sort of um, historical quirk to happen at the time where literary l- l- sort of uh, society of letters is really taking off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, obviously, in the late 18th century, but definitely more into fiction in the in the 19th. Um, just a little bit more from uh, that uh, University of Houston lecture. This is on uh, Hawthorne and history. Hawthorne. Uh read a great deal about the Puritans. In fact, he had almost an obsession about Puritan history. During the 
12-year period after graduation from 1825 until 1837. He borrowed nearly every book in the Salem Athenaeum, which was the public library. His sister-in-law, Elizabeth Peabody, wrote that he was exceptionally knowledge about Salem history, especially the witchcraft era. His reading included Cotton Mather's Wonders of the Invisible World and the Magnalia and many other books besides. And uh, Hawthorne poured over old records. He got into the Salem Annals, which was like bound copies of the old newspapers and records and read them. He got ideas from for his tales from these. The, the, the Hooper story, for instance, the minister's black, minister's uh, Black Veil is something that he probably found in those records. So, Nathalia Hawthorne is the 19th century's American Adam Curtis. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's also funny what to me. The, what the Puritans did not intend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, what will happen next when, like, a little magic is brought into this quiet Massachusetts town. And then the Puritans discovered that existence was entirely depraved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They'd be shocked to find out that the witches were them all along. It was a coven of witches outside Salem, 35 miles. <laughs> it's been too long. I need to watch him again because I can't uh, um, get that cadence. The final thing I will say that I re- relate to... Uh, 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 Hawthorne about it, although I would have been just I would have been with John Brown when he was you know <laughs> doing the murders make no mistake I would have John Brown would have looked to me for moral guidance yes like I would not have been an anti uh, anti-abolitionist uh, um, we need we need John Brown's today uh, <laughs> um, but uh, the thing about Hawthorne post college being completely aimless but educated and uh, going into having a very rough 25th year, uh, specifically, uh, I, I had, m- that was my worst year. That was post-graduation. Couldn't find a job. Uh, oh, yeah. and instead of going into the annals of Salem, uh, history, I went into like Nixon tapes and that yeah. sort of thing. Um, but like that sort of gestation period, I think Nixon calls it, uh, going into, uh, uh, what does he say? I was in the, um, is it, is it, it's on the woods. It's uh, Nixon, literally from the Richard Nixon Foundation, the Wilderness Years Archive. He calls it the Wilderness Years when he was between being vice president and getting back into the office. So when the Kennedys and Johnson was in office. 68. Um, he calls it, he, he basically says he was just eating TV dinners and becoming like, uh, basically worked for law firms, uh, including uh, representing Pepsi. Uh, he was actually in uh, Dallas the day before JFK was shot. Mm. Uh, and, um, but he talks about that as his wilderness years, um, as the time like him watching TV dinners and basically writing his books and and working at these law firms, and screaming at his wife. He, uh, well, according to Cy Hirsch, <laughs> literally like more than that. Yeah, uh, on numerous occasions, and uh, and also shout out Anthony Summers who had that in a book uh, before the Cy Hirsch uh, memoir came out. Anthony Summers, good writer, um, but. I I think despite the uh, sort of the social alienation or maybe a partially because of it uh, and, you know, not really knowing what you're doing with your life despite the fact that you've been prepared to do things mm-hmm. uh, is actually, can actually be a sort of uh, lead to personal growth in a certain way that at least it worked out in my case. Um, yeah, well, you only have like a few moments and at least in, I'm about to turn 30 next week. It seems like so far you only have like a handful of moments to really throw yourself into a topic that you might have interest or like the study that it, the amount of time that it takes to study a topic, you really only have when you're at your lowest points, your points where you're not, where society's like, well, we can't find anything productive (laughs) for you to do. And so you just have to kind of being, be in like capitalism's waiting room until someone finds a spot for you. Exactly. Well, Alex, I think we've covered that. Uh, young Goodman Brown. We went I, through the forest. I, uh, I, 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 I agree with Stephen King. I think this is a... Uh, let's just skim a few of those reaction things before we go here. Um, I think Melville said it was America's um, Inferno, as in Dante's Inferno. Yeah. And th- I mean, I think there's, there's I mean, knowing allusions to that. 
uh, within the story. Oh, really? Ooh, well, I mean, I think just the idea of like, you know, Dante was met by Virgil in, in a wooded area in the opening canto mm. of the Inferno, but it's inverted. Whereas, you know, Virgil is trying to show him the wonders of God's creation. And this yeah. is literally the devil telling him that life doesn't matter. So we'll just read this uh, criti- critical response and impact section on Wikipedia because uh, it's actually good. And this is not going to be an anti-Wikipedia podcast. Anti-Wikipedia shit is lazy. Uh, Wikipedia has as good of a, a accuracy record as the uh, um, Encyclopedia Britannica. Is that still happening? They're still. I feel like that's a really a- anachronistic thing to be complaining about Wikipedia. Right. Well, that's the thing. Is like it's it, it obviously wouldn't be true for more like politically fraught web pages, right? Yeah. But it also would be more democratic than politically fraught encyclopedia pages, which would just say, yeah, the British Empire is fucking awesome, right? Or something <laughs> like that. I mean, I don't think that was an actual entry, but like... Yeah, it's ev- actually, it's weird. Every single entry ended with that sentence. Yeah, well done. Uh, well done, mom. Um, <laughs> 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 um, uh, anyway, here's this, uh, here's this critical response uh, and impact section. Herman Melville said young Goodman Brown was as deep as Dante, and Henry James called it a magnificent little romance, which seems kind of condescending. Yeah. Uh, Hawthorne himself believed that the story made no more impact than any of his tales. That could be like a little humble brag. All of mine are pretty fucking awesome. Yeah. Why are you focused on that one? Why would you compliment one thing when you could compliment everything? Yeah. Uh, Hawthorne himself, blah, 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 blah. Years later, he wrote, these stories were published in magazines and annuals extending over a period of 10 or 12 years and comp- comprising the whole of the writer's young manhood without making, so far as he ever been aware, the slightest impression on the public. Well, guess what, buddy? We're still talking about it yeah. all these years later. Uh, literally, uh, 180. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, contemporary critic Edgar Allan Poe disagreed, referring to Hawthorne's <laughs> short stories as the products of a truly imaginative intellect. Modern scholars and critics generally view the short story as an allegorical tale written to expose the contradictions in place concerning Puritan beliefs and societies. However, there have been many other interpretations of the text, including those who believe Hawthorne sympathizes with Puritan beliefs. I think that is... Yeah. A, yeah. Um, author Harold Bloom comments on the variety of explanations. Okay. And Stephen King has referred to... Uh, which I, I, I'll just say, I tried to read The Stand uh, when I was younger and I couldn't get through it. Though. Never never read a Stephen King. Neither, neither have I. But you know what? He's good on Twitter uh, for something. <laughs> yeah. Um, Stephen King has referred... And some of his movies have, I've enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, Stephen King has referred to the story as, quote, one of the ten best stories written by an American. He calls it his favorite story by Southern and cites it as an inspiration for his O. Henry award-winning short story, The Man in the Black Suit. There you go. So, uh, Young Goodman Brown by Nathaniel Hawthorne. And uh, Alex, I want to thank you very much for joining me again today. It was a good one. Um, for those of you who are listening uh, on the public feed, it'd be we're, we're up to about 20 or so uh, iTunes reviews be cool if you would go there and try to boost me up let's game these charts people all right if you're getting if you're listening to literary hangover gratis uh on either itunes or or stitcher i want to game those uh algorithms i want this to be the biggest book podcast uh there what's is. the biggest book podcast well right there's now? a few and i wouldn't want to say definitively because i haven't done the market research as well as i should have because i'm just going to blow everything out of the water anyway um <laughs> But there's a very few, Hawthorne. There's a few that I like. Um, uh, Mostly lit is out of London. Uh, I, I think that's an enjoyable one. Mm. Um, Does partially examine life? Do they count? N- no, that's philosophy. That's, just philosophy. that's his own section. Yeah. Right? I think that's. I think that's his own section. Um, there's a bookworm. Yeah. Uh, which should we just play a little bit of the bookworm? Uh, here's the bookworm intro. Uh, it's pretty bad. I, I mean, <laughs> look, it's a good, it's a good enough podcast. C- c- call out corner, <laughs> but it's it's very obviously for not the demographic that this podcast is shooting for. Here's the intro. From KCRW and KCRW... 
I mean, I just became illiterate. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, I think that show's been around for a while. It's cool that there's only one person that's uh, listed, and it's Gutenberg. Like, as far as writers. He's not even a writer. He's a printer. Yeah. There you but go, but it's a great question. Where would we be? Unfortunately, it's a rhetorical question. Yeah, and not even that interesting of one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, okay, fine. Like, I think that maybe, like literature and the age of sort of colonization maybe you could say that they helped each other right like your the appetite for british literature is going to uh, like be greater if there's a bunch of people across the world that want to hear about what they're writing right like <laughs> and and you there's no other way to transfer like the, to transport that sort of thing besides like a book is a good format but <laughs> Like, yeah, I don't know. We're now, where spending would we too be? much time on bookworm themes. Uh, yeah, where would we be without the plow? That's a great question. Yeah. Where would we be with a lot of this shit? Yeah, I mean, where would we be without Xbox? I mean, anyway, Alex, uh, that is it. Uh, please uh, either uh, either help me game those those review sections or subscribe at patreon.com slash literary hangover. Uh, until next time, Alex. I'll see you then. <laughs>